Hello, good afternoon and welcome to PME with the channel. This session is very, very important for class 9 student. Subject is science and here we are going to understand something very, very interesting. Let me introduce the topic that is uh, force and laws of motion. Related to this, if you have any query, if you come across with, you can get back to us on our telephone number. You can see on your television screen, double eight double zero four four zero five five nine. Apart from this, you can send your questions and uh, your suggestions through mail on official mail ID for class 9. You can see on your television screen again, dts.class9 at the rate cit.nic.in. To watch this program live, you can tune in PME with the channel number 9. And also, you can watch this program live on NCERT official YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do this on an immediate basis. Let me introduce uh, the experts of today's session. Please welcome Sir uh, Mr. Rahul S. Chatterjee, who is joining us from all the way Shillong from uh, Jail Road, uh, Boys Higher Secondary School, and he is also Assistant physics, physics Lecturer. I welcome you, Mr. Chatterjee. Thank you so much. So all time is yours now. Without making any more delay, any more delay, let's start. Thank you so much. So uh, as you can see, uh, today's lesson is on force and laws of motion. Mm -hmm. And uh, this will be a three-part lesson. Today, we are going to just do part one. And uh, so let us immediately get into it. The point is, uh, let's start with this question. What is force? Now, in everyday life, we regularly see the effects of force, though we can never see force itself. And so could we really uh, kind of evaluate, enumerate what are those effects of force that we see regularly around us. Remember, physics is a subject that we see around us. Physics must not be confined to our textbooks. Physics is everything that happens around, around us. And so uh, we see the effects of force every single day in different ways. What are those? Let's see. It is our common experience that to move a body and set it into motion, we need, a, to, we need to apply a force. Say, for example, when you apply this force, then the body moves. If you didn't apply the force, the body would have stayed there for eternity. Of course, the next idea that would come over here would be if you applied a bigger force, what would happen? But we will not address that today. We will take this up in another lesson because uh, today, let's just get into the basics of everything. So the first thing we, we understood today was that uh, we see the effects of force in the way that when we apply a force, a body moves. Or to stop a moving body, we need to apply a force. A body is already moving. Now you want to stop it, you need to apply a force. For example, if this body is moving, you apply the force and then it stops. Or to change direction of motion, of a body. A body is moving in a particular direction. You want to change its direction. You need to apply a force. Say, for example, this way. You push. It was going from left to right. You applied the force diagonally, kind of. And so the body changed its direction. And this is what we get to see in a game of football, in a game of cricket. Um, constantly, when, when, when in football, uh, someone passes the ball and the second person again passes the ball to a third person, what we are doing is applying a force to the ball to change the direction. In cricket, the bowler bowls the ball in a particular direction. The batsman hits the ball in a different direction to get some runs. So we are applying a force to change the direction. Is that all? Or is there more things that we see that force can do? Well. Force can also change the shape of a body. So we need force to change the shape of a body. Say, for example, when you apply a force in this fashion, the spherical body would have changed its shape into an uh, oval kind of a shape. So if this is what force does, how can we define force then? So well, then we can say force is that agent which changes or tends to change the state of rest or the state of motion or the shape 
of a body. Remember, we said it changes or tends to change. Not all the time would force be uh, able to change the position of a body or to uh, stop a moving body or to be able to change the shape of a body. It can attempt to do so, but not necessarily that it would be able to do so. Say, for example, uh, if you want to move a big boulder, you wouldn't be able to move it. So you're applying a force, but the body doesn't move. But does that mean you did not apply a force? No, you applied a force, so you intended to change its position, but you couldn't, right? Or if a boulder comes rolling down, you might try to stop it, but you might not be successful. You probably will not be successful, so don't even try it. Or you want to change the shape of something very hard, very sturdy, very rigid. You might not be able to change its shape. So that's why we say force is that which that agent which changes or tends to change the state of rest or the state of motion or the shape of a body. Okay. But do we need to apply a force to keep a body in constant motion? Now, once a body is already in motion, do we need a force to keep it in motion? What is our everyday experience? Our everyday experience is that if you put a set of body in motion, it moves, but ultimately it stops. That's our everyday experience, wherever you do it. On a table, if you slide the duster, the duster ultimately stops. Or on your table, if you slide your pen, don't roll it, but slide it, that stops. Even a rolling pen would stop, but a rolling pen would go much farther than a sliding pen. So our everyday experience is that objects ultimately stop. So if I want to really continue to make it move, what would I need then? Then I would certainly require a constant force to be applied. So from our common experience, everyday experience, more than 350 years back, before Galileo and before Newton, this was the thought, this was the law, that if you want to continue a body to move, then you have to continue to apply the force. But then Galileo did some experiments, and these experiments changed the laws completely, or our, 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 our understanding of nature completely, rather. And so the statement of the laws were changed ultimately. So what experiment did Galileo actually do? Let's have a look at that. Uh, but just before that, let's talk of balanced and unbalanced forces for a short time, uh, because we will need this idea uh, when we talk of the next things. All right. So what are balanced forces and what are unbalanced forces? Um, you can see in this diagram, there are two forces, one from the left and one from the right, each of two Newtons, right? If both the forces act on this central body, the ring, at the same time, then they would cancel each other out because the two forces are equal and opposite and acting along the same line. So they would cancel each other out like this. So the body wouldn't move, right? So these are balanced forces. These two forces are balancing each other. There is a force. There are two forces acting on it. It's not that there is no force acting. So there are two forces acting on the body and yet the body does not move. That's because the two forces have canceled each other out. So balanced forces are basically when more than one force acts on a body and the net effect of it is that the forces cancel each other out. Now let us apply a third force. Suppose we push this way, then what happens? Now this is an unbalanced force. There is nothing to cancel this force. So what would happen to the body? The body would be pushed and it would be displaced. So that's an unbalanced force. So you could have numerous situations where 
two forces or three forces or four forces or any number of forces arrange themselves in such a way that they ultimately cancel out. And so they would be balanced forces. And so if they are balanced, the body does not move. But if there is ultimately something that remains unbalanced, some force which could not be canceled out because of the amount of force that has been applied or the direction in which it has been applied. So for some reason, it could not be canceled out. Then there is an unbalanced force. And if there is an unbalanced force, then the body will move. So unbalanced forces actually make motion possible. OK. Now, with that idea in mind and with all the things that we just saw that what forces do, forces uh, can make bodies at rest begin to move. Forces can stop bodies which are already in motion or bodies or, or forces can change the direction of moving bodies. Forces can also change the shape of bodies. Right. So we've seen all of that. So now we're going to take all of that and then uh, look at what Galileo did. So what were Galileo's experiments? So Galileo, what he did was he took a, a smooth uh, curve of this shape. He made a polished surface of this shape. And he also had a polished, very, very highly polished ball so that there is no friction between, or abs almost zero friction. We can't say there is no friction, but zero friction, almost zero friction between these two surfaces, between, the surf between this curved surface and the surface of the ball. And then he dropped it from this height. And what did he notice? That this ball would fall and climb up to the same height on the other side. And whatever number of times he repeated it, and from whatever different heights he repeated it, he would find that it would always go back to the same height. So what he did was he tried different shapes of this curved surface. So this one is kind of symmetric. So the next one is unsymmetric. And he tried this experiment again. And what was the result? Here again, it went up to the same height again. Notice that if we draw a line down here, right down the middle, then this path is much shorter than this path. So the body is going a much longer path. But what, is, what remains constant? What remains constant is the height up to which the body is climbing. It's exactly the same height from which the body fell. So if you drop it from a height h above the ground, then the ball also climbs up to a height h above the ground again. So what happens if I increase this inclination, or rather decrease the inclination even more? Then what happens? So let's try this. So this time, again, everything is very polished. So friction is very little. And uh, so Galileo drops this ball. And the ball again climbs up to the same height. Each time the ball is dropped, the ball climbs up to the same height, even though the length of the path keeps on increasing. So it is irrespective of the length of the path. So what Galileo did was he made the right hand side completely flat. And if he does that, what is your guess? What would happen? Now, before I go to that, I want to spend some time on looking at this diagram and understanding why the body climbs up to the same height. So if I just go back to this animation, whether it is this or the previous animation, all in, in all of these animations, uh, whatever is the height from which the ball is dropped, the ball goes back or climbs up to the same height again. Now, what is happening over here? Why does the ball climb up to the same height? When the body is in the original position at this height, it has a certain gravitational potential energy. 
gravitational potential energy is given by mass of the body times acceleration due to gravity g times the height of the body above the ground so mgh so it has a certain gravitational potential energy and that potential energy is mgh now we know from the law of conservation of energy that energy cannot be destroyed it cannot be created but it can only be transformed from one form to another or it can be transferred from one body to another so what is happening here in this case of course it is not being transferred to any other body so the only thing that can happen here in this case is transformation so what kind of transformation is taking place so initially the body is at rest and when the body is dropped that gravitational potential energy because of the height that gravitational potential energy decreases as the height decreases and at the lowest point it has the lowest gravitational potential energy but as it is falling its velocity increases or rather its speed increases and so its kinetic energy increases so as the gravitational potential energy decreases kinetic energy increases so there is conversion of energy taking place transformation of energy taking place up to this point so where the uh, gravitational potential energy would be zero if i say that is the ground level then gravitational potential energy would be zero at this point and beyond this and at this point kinetic energy would be maximum that means the entire energy that the body had has been converted into kinetic energy from this point onwards as the body climbs up then what happens the kinetic energy again gets converted into potential energy and back into gravitational potential energy and so since the amount of energy still remains the same the energy cannot be destroyed the energy cannot be created nobody is adding extra energy there is no external source of energy in this situation so the total energy that the body had is constant throughout the journey so it can only climb up to the same height when it goes to the other side and that is what we have seen in all the three animations so what is happening is the body will tend to climb to the same height so that it maintains the say or, or it acquires the same potential energy again because the energy cannot be destroyed it has that amount of energy and with that amount of energy it can climb up to the same point and so that's what we see here so it climbs up to the same point so if we open this up even further the right hand side if we open this up even further then what happens so if we make this completely flat then this potential energy the gravitational potential energy that the body has now because of this height above the ground this potential energy is not being destroyed at all or not being converted not destroyed it cannot be destroyed is not being converted into any other form because it's not climbing up so the it remains as kinetic energy so this potential energy now gets converted into kinetic energy the kinetic energy is maximum and this kinetic energy is not getting converted into anything else and so if the kinetic energy remains constant the body will continue to move because the energy has not been taken away from it and the law of conservation of energy says the energy cannot be destroyed and we have not touched the system at all to take away the energy from it or neither are we adding any energy to it so whatever energy we gave we gave it right at the beginning when we placed the body here and so if we now let go of this body it will continue to move forever and ever along this straight line along the horizontal path and galileo actually did this experiment and the first time he did it he found that the body would go very a very long distance but ultimately it stopped and he realized that it stopped because of the friction between the two surfaces between the surface of this ball and the flat surface so the next time he did the experiment he polished the two surfaces even further and he realized when he repeated the experiment this time the ball would 
really continue to move a much larger distance, almost not stop. So our understanding therefore changes completely. Our common experience all these years was that in everyday life, what we see is a body in motion ultimately stops. It does not continue to move. But now we realize through these experiments that, well, it stops because there is a force being applied. We didn't get to see the force. We did not actively apply the force, but there was a force. What, what, what force was that? It was the force of friction. So friction was acting on the body and stopping it. So if we remove the friction by polishing this surface and polishing the ball, then the body would certainly continue to move. And so to summarize what we have learned so far and then come to the conclusion that Galileo made and then from him what Newton made. So first we said to move a body and set it into motion, we need to apply a force. And then we said to stop a moving body, we need to apply a force. Then to change direction of motion of a body, we need to apply a force. And so if you sum up these three into one single statement, then we can have our first law of motion. And that is every body continues in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line until and unless an externally impressed force compels it to change. Externally impressed means externally applied. It has to be applied from outside, okay? Outside the system. That's the meaning of this. So if you want, if you don't apply a force on a body, then a body at rest would continue to remain at rest forever and ever. And if a body is in motion, then it will continue to remain in motion in a straight line, uniformly, that means it wouldn't increase its speed, it wouldn't decrease its speed, and it would continue to move in a straight line. As long as you don't touch it, you don't apply an external force. Mr. Chatterjee, let me remind you of some time limit. We have only four minutes left now. I'm done. I just wind up this and I'm done. This is, the, uh, this is part one of the lesson. So we're going to continue uh, from this point onwards. So basically, uh, what I would request uh, students to do at this point is uh, understand uh, where the first law comes from, the first law of motion comes from. So uh, our common experience was, as I said, that a body at rest continues to remain at rest. A body in motion will continue to remain in uniform motion. And to change that, you need to apply a force. A body at rest, if you want to change that into motion, you need to apply a force. A body in motion, you want to change its direction, you want to apply, you need to apply a force. And so, and from Galileo's experiments, we have seen that once you set it in motion, it would continue to remain in motion. So if we summarize all of these three things together and put it into one statement, this is the result. And this is what we know as Newton's first law of motion, that everybody continues in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line until and unless an externally impressed force compels it to change. Let's stop there and we will continue with this chapter again uh, with more ideas, more concepts, and uh, towards the end we will also uh, take up some numerical problems and solve these uh, numerical problems in your textbook. So let's call it a day today. Thank you. Uh, before, before we wind up the session, any message would you like to give to our audience, uh, Mr. Chatterjee? Absolutely. Um, see, th this, this particular law uh, is important both from uh, the exam point of view, mm -hmm. as well as those students who want to take up uh, physics as a career or any career that involves physics. Understanding this law and all its concepts is extremely important. So it's just not about learning up the uh, statement of the law by heart, mm -hmm. but I would urge all learners to get into the nitty gritty of it and understand from where this law comes and why this statement. And that is what I have covered in that, tried to cover in this lesson or tried to explain in this lesson. Uh, number two, uh, this is also very important historically. 
because our understanding of the laws of nature was something but then when Galileo did the experiment uh, the true understanding of the laws of nature uh, came up and that was a landmark moment in the understanding of physics and so both ways the, this is really really important so students I would want you to not only uh, you know uh, prepare yourself for an exam but look at the larger picture look at the history of science look at how things develop and you get the larger picture you will get more involved in it you would love your subject much more and your understanding will go up many times more that's my message absolutely so thank you so much for your time sir uh, the way you enlightened us uh, that is absolutely phenomenal so we are extremely grateful to your immense knowledge and intellect and uh, uh, thank you so much for your time once again mr chatterjee thank you so much my pleasure and thank you so much all the uh, viewers who say were watching this program around this globe through the NCERT official. Uh, nothing to go anywhere because next session is for uh, Hindi class 9 student. There you will come to know about uh, Yamraj Ki Disha, Jokiya Kavita Hai, Chandrakant Dev Tali Ji Ki. Kahima Jai, Bani Riyamir Saab.